So the first is just sort of debating the critique generally, uh, wrapping our mind around what makes up a critique, how we debate a critique when we're on the negative, how we answer when we're asked, how we might put together a critical affirmative, and how we might debate a critical affirmative if we're negative. Uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is different critiques on this topic. So what's the inventory of arguments that you want to be familiar with so that you can be prepared to debate that critique on this year's high school revolution? And then the third thing we'll be talking about a little bit toward the end is the security critique specifically. Uh, that's the one that we have in the evidence packet. So we're, we'll talk about how we can deploy that argument, how we can answer that argument in our practice and based on elsewhere. Okay. So without further ado, I'm Rob Mahal. I'd love to start. Hey, Mahal. Hey. What's your name? Rob. <laughs> Rob. Like Rob. Robert. Oh, All right. So. The critique is really just another argument from the beginning that something that the negative has in their toolbox that they can sort of throw against the <coughs> right? Please. So Thanks. you notice the affirmative typically gets up and they present a plan and they defend that plan with a set of advantages, right? So the negative has a few options when they first get up to try and beat the X. And the first option, right, would be topicality, where they say the plan the affirmative is presented is outside of the boundaries of the resolution, so we shouldn't have to debate it. The second argument they could prevent would be present would be a disadvantage, where they would say doing the app causes something bad to happen, so we ought not to do the plan. Okay, the third would be a counter plan, where we say doing the plan foregoes the opportunity to do something better, so instead we ought to pursue this alternative course of action that is competitive with the app. Right? And then the critique comes in as something where we're no longer just asking questions about the plan but we start looking at the 1AC as a whole. Okay, so this definition, I use the word interrogate too much, oops, uh, says that an argument that interrogates the beliefs, values, or assumptions of an affirmative case and argues that they should be interrogated and criticized would be how we understand uh, the definition of a critique. Okay, so what do I mean by this? Well, if we look at the security critique, for example, which you have in your evidence packet, what that critique is basically saying in a nutshell, is that the whole reason the affirmative tells us to do the plan is to secure ourselves from these dangerous threats, right? We're going to have the environment get destroyed and we're all going to die. China's going to have too much influence in Latin America and we're all going to die. And, you know, that's the whole sort of rationale for the affirmative is that we need to be more secure. And security critique says that when that's sort of our primary value, when we put all of our emphasis on security, right, then we begin to treat security as all that we need, and we don't really pursue the more important goals that life might have to offer, such as improving our quality of life, right? We never live dangerously, so to speak. Okay, so we'll talk more about specifics going forward, but the key thing to understand here is that what's at stake with the critique is not necessarily is the plan a good idea, but it is instead are the reasons that they have presented for the plan something that we ought to get behind from the standpoint of values, assumptions, and so forth. Okay, the critique showed up in the early 1990s. That's just sort of a historical piece of information. The debate changed a lot over time, so interesting to think about that. Um, and it initiates this debate about what should be the question of the debate. Okay, so a critique typically doesn't just say the app has this belief or assumption and that belief or assumption is bad. It also says that dealing with this belief or assumption is more important than answering the question of is the plan a good idea. Okay, so the negative starts to offer what we call roll of the ballot arguments, where they say, you know, you shouldn't, as a judge, be too concerned about, you know, should we or should we not increase our economic engagement with Cuba, but instead, when we are presented with a proposal to increase our economic engagement with Cuba, we ought instead to think about the sorts of values and assumptions that are going into that advocacy. Okay, so this is pretty, you know, intangible theoretical stuff at the moment. Let's sort of get into the nitty gritty of what it looks like. Okay, but before we do that, let's talk about why you ought to pay attention in the first place. Okay, why do we actually want to know what a critique is? Why do we want to learn this stuff? It's complicated, blah, blah, blah. Okay, the first thing is, probably going to have to answer them. Okay, critiques are uh, 
major elements of the negative arsenal at this point. So you want to have at least the basic familiarity so that you can deal with these arguments, right, when they're presented by your opponent. Uh, I think they're a very strategic argument to have on your side. Okay, there's lots of situations in which a critique might be something that can push you over the edge in a, in a situation where you otherwise might lose. You can go ahead and win if you've got uh, another argument in the box, right? Uh, many of your opponents have trouble with them, okay? If you find critiques, especially at the beginning, to be kind of confusing and difficult, you are certainly not alone, okay? I would say that I really didn't understand much about critiques at all until my junior year of college, when the coaches said, hey, Rob, you gotta go debate with this girl. By the way, she only goes for critiques, and since she's older than you, she'll be uh, filling out the judge's preferences, so you might want to learn to debate the critique, too. And I was like, I really hate you guys, but I'll do it. And then the last thing is they're useful outside of debate. Okay, so when we research critiques, we tend to be reading, you know, literature from philosophers and theoretical critics, and these people are the kind of people that you will be using, you know, if you write a college English paper and that kind of thing to do literary criticism and whatnot. So a lot of the scholarship that you come across with critiques is something that you can use, right, as you pursue your liberal arts education, um, even beyond that. Nope. Uh, I don't know, Cameron. Ricardo, is there a way I can go back here? Hit the left arrow. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's PowerPoint is going to be posted online, by the way. Yeah, you made my life amazing last night. Because I had to make a one minute, and it was just so amazing. Good to hear. Round of applause for Ricardo. During Rob's lecture. <laughs> that the security people would be making then 
is that sort of illustrates how there can be these negative consequences and repercussions from having that value of security. So we'll continue talking more about this, but the implication is where you start to say there's problematic, right, uh, habits and trajectories associated with this belief or value or assumption that we gotta get away from. Okay, and the alternative is where we sort of say we ought to respond, right, to this belief, value, or assumption differently than the way that the act is asking us to do. So instead of saying, ah, yes, we will be insecure if we don't have economic engagement with Cuba, therefore we ought to have economic engagement with Cuba, the, the critique says, you know, maybe we ought to start criticizing the emphasis on security and start thinking about maybe other values that we could use to think about how to build our you know, political life the way we want. Okay, good with this slide? Great. Let's talk about debating critiques on the negative. Okay, y'all know who this is? Karl Marx. Karl Marx, okay? Uh, Karl Marx, big, big guy in criticism. All right. Our, perhaps the most common critique y'all will encounter um, on this year's topic is the capitalism critique, and Karl Marx sort of initiated that. So, let's talk about constructing one of these, okay? So, when you're making a critique, you want to get it ready to go. Uh, the first thing you've got to put together is your one empty argument. Right? We talked about how the components of the critique are the link, the implication, the alternative. So those are sort of the three parts of the one MC that you would put together if you were going to put together your one MC. There's a good example of this in the security K file that's in our evidence packet. Um, but a few considerations that I would urge you to take note of, okay, as you're preparing to put together your one MC when you do this with other arguments and arguments you're making for yourself, right? So first of all, framework and roll the ballot. Okay, so by framework and roll the ballot, what I mean is sort of answering the question of what is the question? Okay, so as I said, with critique, you're generally not just taking for granted that the question of debate, of the debate is, is the plan a good idea? So you want to be thinking about what am I going to say instead, right, should be the central question at stake in the debate? All right, and the reason that's true is because it really helps you to sort of say, here's the link, right, if you can say what is at stake in the debate more generally. Right? If you can say what sort of question should we be answering, then you can begin to answer that question with your link, right, and your alternative. Okay, uh, you want to be thinking about the relationship between the link and the alternative. Okay, so critiques tend to focus on something specific about an affirmative and not necessarily on the belief value or assumption across the board. Okay, so with the security critique, one of the things that I think is difficult for people who are first like starting to argue with, you know, is that is that if the negative saying, you know, let's think about security differently, why can't the app say that too? Right? And typically the reason that there's not some sort of really effective permutation is because the negative will say our linked arguments and our alternative are very connected. So we use our link to say what's wrong with the app security politics specifically, giving specific examples from the 1AP of where they've made problematic assumptions and so forth, and our alternative is to reject those problems that we find within the 1AP and not merely a wholesale rejection of every consideration for security. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, first one, like the link. Would like the link to the, or would the link be just like an empirical example, like Iraq or something, of how, or of how it link the alternative? No, um, so the, the Iraq example, I think, is a useful illustration for the implication. Okay, and the reason that's worth thinking about is just because paid debaters tend to do a little better if they can spin in some historical analysis and so forth. But the link is where you say, here's what it is about the affirmative that we're critical of. Okay, so um, I believe in the 1NC in the evidence packet, the link in the 1NC says that you know, our policies toward Latin America have been 
sort of guided by this impulse for security that has been problematic. Okay, so similar to a disset, the link says the affirmative does this, and then the implication says that has negative consequences. Right, so first we say our policy towards Latin America is guided by security, and then we say when our policies are guided by security, it leads to bad things happen. Okay, okay cool. And right, then, oh, yeah. Uh, um, the alternative, like, can you, I guess, can you just like, just explain how the alt would work? Yeah, I mean, so the alt, if we, this is why I said, you know, think about rules down a little bit, right? So the critique is implicitly arguing that the central question at stake in the debate should not be, is the plan a good idea, but should instead be, you know, is the 1AC as an advocacy something that we ought to get behind? And as an advocacy, I mean not just the proposal or plan of action that it offers, but also the way that it justifies that advocacy. So the alternative would say we ought to, or you as the judge, ought to reject the act's implicit value assumption of security, right, in the way the 1AC is constructed, right? So. What you know, I was saying earlier is that whereas a disadvantage says the plan causes bad things to happen, a critique sort of lets you do an analysis of the 1AC as a text, where you're saying, you know, judge, if you were reading this 1AC in the newspaper, you ought to consider it bad writing because it is based on these beliefs or assumptions that we ought not to get behind. Does that kind of make sense? I mean, we'll work through this a little bit more, but the alternative is really saying reject the 1AC because the 1AC incorporates flawed assumptions. Does that make sense? Okay. Reject the 1AC because it incorporates flawed assumptions. Well, I guess what you Yeah, I mean, you would just say that. Those flawed assumptions have historically, right, been problematic and had problematic consequences. So you're not saying like if you do the plan, then Iraq war, right? What you are saying is that the Iraq war happened based on a similar structure of reasoning and values, and therefore, when we encounter those values being put into practice in service of an advocacy. Instead of just getting behind that advocacy, we ought to turn a more critical eye toward those value consumptions. But wouldn't that be more off topic though? Not necessarily, right? So imagine that President Obama got up on TV tomorrow and was like, I think that Somalia might have nuclear weapons. And so, I think we should go to war with Somalia. Have you lost this freaking mind? I mean, that is right. That would be the response, right? It would be like, have, have we done this before? You know, there. I think there would be a second where it was like, I don't care how much evidence you have. We've been down this road before, and it seems like it might be a bad idea. What is going on? Okay, so I do think. There's, you know, there's more to it than just saying is the plan a good idea, but it's still relevant. So it's critiquing the Yeah, critiquing the values or assumptions of one. Okay. Are you gonna talk about like security rhetoric? Security rhetoric? Yeah, I mean a little bit. I can talk about that later. Um, but anyway, so the last thing I said to consider is the text the alt, the permutation, right? Um, so we'll talk a little bit about how the app, you know, one of their primary arguments in their toolbox is to permute the critique, and so you want to write your alternative in a way that makes it as difficult as possible for the app to do that effectively, right? I don't think you'd ever want to write your alternative security critique, for example, to say, reject security rhetoric, right? Instead, you would say, reject the 1AC's security rhetoric. Right? And the reason for this is that if you make it more narrow, and, and there's sort of a one-to-one -one correspondence between your link and your alternative, then it's more difficult for them to say, vote for the 1AC and reject the 1AC's assumptions. Right? It's a much more difficult sell the permutation than to say, 
rejects all security rhetoric except our name. Right, which permutation will you let us use next? Okay. So, we got our 1 and C, but now it's time to put the K into practice and move it further into the debate. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is debate the way. Okay, so I've provided sort of an organizational element here, which is that I think you can effectively do your link work on the permutation. Uh, the next thing that I have written up there is perhaps one of the most essential pieces of advice you will possibly get from this lecture, which is that when you are debating the link for a critique, you want to scrutinize and use the 1AC evidence to provide examples and specify exactly what it is that you're saying. Okay, so one thing about critique that makes it appealing to some people and less appealing to others is that it's somewhat less evidence-driven than other positions in debate. Okay, you don't need a million cards for winning with the critique. K are notorious for reading five or six cards in the entire debate, right? But doing the analysis to make those five or six cards matter and win for them at the end. Okay, and part of the way this is done is by specifying how your argument is true in the specific context of the one AC that you were debating. Okay? So for example, if I was going to debate the security critique against this one AC, can you think about maybe a place in the 1AC as it's written now that we might say here's where they're placing emphasis on security in a way that might be problematic or dangerous? China. Yeah, what do they say about China? China. Right, we say that if China gains influence in Latin America, they're going to kill us all. Right? So that's maybe a place where we could go and say it looks like there's some hasty assumptions being made that are based on a perhaps unwarranted right, uh, predisposition towards United States influence that constructs other potential countries as hostile and dangerous. Okay, so if you can point to that China example and say, here's how the 1AC is engaging in this problematic right, search for security by their depiction of China, then your link argument becomes substantially more sophisticated and your argument becomes more compelling. Okay? One of the things that judges dislike the most about critique debating is when it remains, you know, very abstract and evidence-driven. Okay? Um, so that's, that's kind of a good thing because it means that, you know, if you're debating a critique you've never heard before, but you notice that your opponents are basically just reading cards, then you know that no matter how confusing it all seems to you, it probably seems confusing to your judge too. Okay? The, the best K debaters and the people who win with critique are those who are able to make clear to everyone exactly what's being said by specifically explaining their argument in the context of the one AC. Um, and so the link is where you really want to be, be focused on doing that. Okay, uh, the next thing I've put up here is to construct modules where you sort of combine the link and implication. Okay, and this is something that's especially pertinent with something like security critique. All right, and the reason is that you can connect various forms of security rhetoric to various specific consequences. Okay, so for example, non-proliferation is a sort of link that can be combined with an implication to sort of have a module. What do I mean by module, by the way? Anyone know? Kind of a model that you're showing you how to win your um, argument. Okay. Uh, what about though in the context of like uh, argument and debate? What would a module look like? Yeah. Is it kind of like a extension of the block? Like it's still an extension of the block? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like kind of similar to a block. Um, so the key thing that I'm saying here about module is really just that it's kind of like a 1MC without an alternative. Okay, so a module 
for the security critique might be right something that just talks about non-proliferation. And it says that the rhetoric of non-proliferation is premised on this logic of security, and in practice, it causes bad consequences. Okay, so anyone know what I mean by non-proliferation? What do I mean? Non-buildup of nuclear weapons, right? So non-proliferation is you know, something where, for example, my Iraq war example I was talking about earlier could come into play, where I would say, look, the 1AC says that we need to do the plan because it prevents nuclear proliferation, but the whole desire to contain nuclear proliferation is based on the idea that it's safe for us to have nuclear weapons, but it's not safe for other people to have nuclear weapons. That rhetoric is dangerous and problematic and has yielded negative consequences that we ought to be skeptical of endorsing that rhetoric against. Okay? Um, so we'll talk more maybe in a little bit when we get to security critique about what sorts of modules you can build for this critique. But the nice thing, the reason I put this up here is because it's basically like you can have new dissatisfaction with, uh, with crappy titles put together um, in your negative block and that puts more pressure on the white heart. Okay, so I put some things here to be aware of. The first is that, you know, this is the toughest element for the negative or for the opponent to contest. We say most of the time that the negative is almost always going to win some link to their critiques, but at the same time, perhaps the most important part for you to focus on because when it's done well, it makes the critique really effective. When it's done poorly, it can make the critique very ineffective. And then, as I said earlier, also, it can't just be developed through hard. Right, analytical explanation is totally necessary to make a critique work. So, debating implications. We've already talked a little bit about these modules. Uh, I know it's probably still a little bit unclear out there, but I think the best way to, to clarify this will be when we actually get into the security critique and are able to look at some specific examples that we might actually put together for our module. Um, so, to talk about debating implications just a little bit more, first of all is Think about you know what I said here about historical examples and anecdotes, right? Using that sort of explanation to illustrate why your impact arguments are true. Right? Another thing is to think about how you can use that sort of impact analysis to talk about terms of case arguments or takes out solvency. Right? So an example here with the security critique is this argument that's known as the self-fulfilling prophecy. Alright, does anyone not named Brian, know what a self-fulfilling prophecy argument might say? Yeah, sure. Um, like, yeah. Yeah, okay, that's, that's a great explanation. So the self-fulfilling prophecy argument for the security critique is that when we perceive someone as a threat and we start to act to them like they are threatening, then they, in fact, become more threatened. So that can make their own problem. Yeah, exactly. Right? I mean, like, imagine if you just walked up to someone who is, like, new to your school, and you were like, I hate you, you scare me. Right? How are they going to react to you in future interactions? They're not going to like you anyway. Right? Exactly. So that would be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay? You, uh, and the self-fulfilling prophecy argument is helpful because it means that you can sort of take out solvency for the app or make a turn to the case argument where you say, if we base our thinking on security logic, then we are going to create the very problems that we are hoping to contain or avoid. All right, so think about ways that you can use the critique to turn the case and take out solvency. Another example would be if I was using a cap case, right? The critique of capitalism. And I thought I'd establish that the affirmative policy of economic engagement was in lockstep with the system of global capitalism. Then I come across this environment advantage with our Cuba app. What am I probably going to say? Sort of turns the case very threatening. Yeah? Capitalism destroys the environment. Absolutely. Right? You have this environment advantage. I say, turns the case. If the affirmative is upholding global capitalism, then we are going to have the environment destroyed anyway. Can I, can I help you? You say you can't see something up here? It's like, it's kind of dull. It's not just, it's really I wonder if I put the windows down, if that might help a little bit. 
I've got the license here. Yeah. No. Is that better? Because 
a lot of times Cronus will sort of be asking these angry questions and the critique will be like, how exactly does me reading this 1AC mean this war with China? And it's like, you know, it's not what we're saying, but we are saying that we shouldn't be taking time the 1AC the way it's written, because it's based on these problematic values. Okay. Bring the alternative. Okay, so yeah, we just lost sight. That's probably one of the most important things for him. Great. Okay. So first, the alternative. Okay. Avoid oversimplification. Uh, alternatives are not end-oriented; they're process-oriented. Okay. You're not defending a product; you're defending a process. You're not imagining a world where security is no, no longer a problem and it's all puppy dogs and ice cream and everyone's happy. Okay. Instead, you're saying that we need to engage in a process of critical reflection where instead of putting all of our emphasis on security, right, we are interrogating and scrutinizing the terms around which we construct political life. Right? So some of the best uh, alternative evidence for the security critique says that the first thing we need to do is start this process of questioning, and then later we will be able to figure out what exactly we ought to do. So you may have said this is a cop out, and you may be right, but it's also incredibly strategic for the negative, right? So the Bruce card between the YNC for the security critique is one of the most fantastic cards I've ever seen on this process versus product claim, because what it says is that first we must engage in critical questioning, then specific policies may follow. Before we can debate about what we should do, first we debate about how we debate. All right, so with the alternative, you're putting at stake what is the fundamental you know, belief, values, or assumptions that we ought to uphold. So you don't necessarily present the alternative ones that you would replace the bad ones with. So this is strategic for you as a negative, because you can basically say the affirmative has incorporated some problematic belief, values, or assumptions that we ought to reject, okay? And you don't have to say, instead of those, here's some better ones, all right? So alternative is almost uh, the wrong word. Right now, if someone in Prospex were to ask you, you know, like, what alternatives are there to security rhetoric, you can't just be like, Rob Mahal told me I didn't have to answer you, right? <laughs> but instead, what you would say is that, you know, this debate is about the 1AC as an advocacy. We've read evidence that the values and assumptions informing your 1AC are problematic and contingent, right, and worthy of scrutiny, and it's your burden to defend it. Yeah? Question. What do you think what is the world of the alternative? Right, okay. Uh, so is there, is there a question back there? Can you get it up on the... Uh, I was just like wondering, like, I guess, I don't think you've gone through this yet, but like, I was just wondering, like, how would you, like, play, like, the impacts of, like, the acts of, like, like, the obvious impacts like, yeah. versus, like, the real world that you actually get? Okay, so yeah, so let's, let's deal with both of these questions. The first question is, how do you answer the question of what is the world of the alternative? Okay, and I think the answer to that is that the world of the alternative is the world we're in right now. Like, we're in this room, we're waiting by your 1AC, we're saying your 1AC has some problems, but the judge ought not to get behind it. Okay? The world of critique is not like puppy dogs and ice cream. The world of the critique is where we are. Okay? So I think when someone says the world of the critique, you kind of feign confusion and sort of say, like, you know, what is the world of, I don't know, you know, like, here, we're here now, you've read a 1AC. Your 1AC is bad because it's premised on beliefs and values that we don't agree with. Okay? And so then in terms of how to weigh you know, the critique versus the app, I think that is you know, something that we can talk about now, especially since we've already talked about implications. I think you know, the, the main way to do so is to say, look, the authorities is presenting you a set of scenarios that they say are problematic and we ought to avoid, right? But our response to the negative is to say the sorts of problems that you are identifying will continue to recur so long as we are embracing the beliefs, values, or assumptions that you have endorsed. 
And therefore, in order for us to ever address those problems in any meaningful way, we need to construct some alternative approach. All right, and so to put this in very debater jargonish terms, right? Basically what you're saying with the critique is sort of a try or die slash probability outweighs time frame argument, where you're saying we have the root cause of why the affirmative impacts are going to happen, and the affirmative plays into that root cause. Therefore, you ought to reject the affirmative in order to address the problems that they face. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Okay, yeah, of course. I'm so confused about this one question. Because I know like when I was in the data, I'm like I technically asked that question before too, because like it's like an alternative to looking at like a different way, I guess like what I guess I kind of look at it as like can you just explain it more? I guess mm -hmm. that would Okay, so you say what is the role of the alternative? I say the role of the alternative is this world, this room, this debate. Okay? The role of the alternative is not security no longer exists, no one cares about security anymore. See, the alternative doesn't see out anything. Well, well, how do like, you... I've had other teams like actually answer, like, yeah, like in the world of the alternative, there will be no more security bodies or like, yeah. Well, like, you know what I say when I'm affirmative? Wrong. Permutation. Permutation, no more security, and the plan. Right? I'm, I'm not saying that you're wrong that people say that. There is lots of very bad K debating that happens. Right? The thing about K debating is it tends to attract, you know, some people who would indulge in perhaps doing less work and making grand claims, right? But Ideally, you want to use the you know K-debate effectively and be you know a good debater with the critique. Then you're going to be driven by hard work, just a different type of hard work, right? And so I think the way to do that is to answer these questions in a sophisticated way um, that is most akin to what you would find in the literature. So when you're debating the alternative, you're just saying like what the way you're wanting to phrase it is what is going on in this round is bad because you're like talking about this like security logic. And so in the world of the alt, like everything feels the same same, just like sort of one Well here's the thing, okay? I wouldn't so here's second way of answering this question. Once you've said like there is no world of the alternative, the world is just new or whatever, the next thing you say is that breaking with the thought processes that we're criticizing is the first step toward things ever becoming different. Right, so you're not saying that everything necessarily stays the same, but you're also not predetermining what change would look like. Right, we don't know. There's a, a popular alternative card to the security critique um, by this guy Neoclius, where he's like, we don't know exactly what alternative political language will replace that of security. Right, but the first step is breaking with that security rhetoric entirely. Right? So it's like, first of all, you say there is no separate world that we see out. The second thing you say is that our criticism of these problematic values and assumptions is the first step toward things being differently. And then third, you say we're not prefiguring exactly how it would be different, but we must reject the app in order to address those problems. Is that just what the critique or is it just like... No, I think that... I, I think that's something that people use with a lot of different arguments, right? So with the capitalism critique, for example, you know, most people don't get up and say, time to go back to Soviet Russia, right? Instead, what they say is rejecting security is the first step towards conducting an alternative political economy that would be more equitable and less destructive. Right? So it's a similar argument where it's like the role of the alternative is still the role of this room. We think you're wanting to be participating in lots of global capitalism that merits rejection. The alternative is a prerequisite for breaking with capitalism in a productive way. I'm doing everything I can to avoid your recording technologies. <laughs> yeah? So if, 
You're saying the negative reads a security critique. And they read a counter plan, a counter plan like the China counter plan. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's still the need to deeply logic. So what what people normally answer that question of how, why do those not conflict with each other is in both the world. But if there's no separate huh. world, it can't. I see. Okay. So um, I I get what you're saying. Um, so here's a few things. First of all, I think when someone asks, you know. You've read a counter plan and a critique. I think you don't necessarily say those are multiple worlds. You say those are different arguments, right? You've read one argument, which is that he ought to prefer this counter plan. There's a better action that the app foregoes, right? And then we've also read this critique, which says the values of the assumptions of 1AC merit rejection. Um, now, so. From the first step, it's like I would not say these are multiple worlds, I would say these are different arguments. The second thing is I would say, okay, the, the arguments are different and the rationale for the critique is not the counter plan, just as the critique is not the rationale for the counter plan. Okay, so a lot a lot of times, right, teams want to ask this question. Are people following this? This is actually pretty important, right? If you're negative, you read the security critique and you also read a counter plan, and your counter plan's net benefit is like politics or China VA, right? Something that clearly engages in security rhetoric, right? It's a good affirmative argument to point out that there's some tension there. It's a little bit illegitimate for the negative to get up and say, we have to reject security rhetoric as like that which is in the 1AC, and China's a big threat, so we should do a counter plan, right? Um, the negative response to this, I think, is to say these are two separate arguments. You will not go for both of them at the same time, right? And then to say the rationale for the security critique is not the counter plan, just as the rationale for the counter plan is not the security critique, right? So there's not the same uh, connection between the arguments as there is between the 1AC plan and its advantages. The reason why you say that the 1AC as a whole merits rejection is because Security logic is the fundamental underpinning assumption between every rationale that's given for the affirmative plan. Right? It is a coherent advocacy that incorporates security rhetoric throughout. The negative arguments are different because you don't have one advocacy, you have multiple arguments against uh, the, the affirmative. Now, I've already said that you know, I don't think you would use the language of multiple worlds, but if you did want to use the language of multiple worlds, here's what I would say, right? The world of the critique is the world we're in right now, this round. The world of the counter plan is where we see out China does something else. And the world of status quo is where we imagine the government does nothing. Right? But here and now, us as individuals, that is the world of the critique. Now, another thing I'll say is that you want to avoid getting caught up in the language of like movement. Okay? A lot of teams when they're defending the critique will be saying things like, you know, when you sign your ballot, judge, today you can start a revolution and capitalism will be over tomorrow, right? And that is typically not a great solvency argument, right? So you don't want to be framing your alternative through language of a movement, right? Or even really the judge like signing on to some broader political project with you. Instead, you just want to say that from our standpoint as intellectuals who are talking about advocacy, the most productive thing the judge could endorse would be this thought process of critical reflection that we have presented in the one of the Yeah, hi. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What, is, what do you mean when you say typically non oriented Yeah, okay. So what I'm saying is that the alternative represents a process and not a product. Okay, so. Uh, this is like there is no world of the critique. Okay, so when when I say reject the ask security logic, I'm not saying imagine a world where security logic no longer exists. Instead, what I'm saying is that in this debate round, the attorneys ought to leave because their advocacy is bad, and that is part of a process of critical reflection, right? That doesn't necessarily have an end point. Right, so all I'm trying to urge you to think about is that you're never necessarily reading a counter plan. You're not 
e i we think. Instead, what you're saying is that we ought to engage in this process of criticism for which we cannot predetermine an endpoint or a final outcome. So basically, you just want the after period of life is bad. Um, but we're not saying that securitization, or we're not saying that, like, we get rid of the entire, or get rid of securitization in its entirety, but I mean, look at our future debate round as the app is advocating for security. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, I wouldn't be like, we're not advocating getting rid of security letters entirely because that makes it sound like we're kind of hedging. You know, I think the better way to put this is the question of the debate is, is the 1AC something the judge should vote for? Right? And that's the only question we have to answer. So our response is no, because it incorporates these belief values or assumptions that we find problematic. Right? In saying that those belief values or assumptions are problematic, we are not proposing some alternative world in which these belief values or assumptions no longer exist. We're just saying that it is the authority's burden to defend those belief values or assumptions since they provide the fundamental underpinning for the 1A. I recognize that I'm speaking aggressively, and so still feel free to ask questions. This is not directed at you. This is directed at the imaginary opponent that you will be debating. I want you to be able to mimic it and go for it. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? OK, cool. No problem. Do well, we have more questions? This is really complicated stuff, so more questions than that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was just wondering, like, is sometimes like the like, 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 how is that, like, actually solved? So, like, how would that actually like, work? Because it just seems like they didn't want to be like, in this process. Yeah, okay, uh, so a few things. Um, so the main reason I think the negatives get away with vote neg is because they can just be like, if we have established that these belief values or assumptions are that, and that they are part of the 1AC, then the app ought to lose, right? So again, it's sort of like, you know, these problems might exist already in the world, but if they are truly problems and your 1AC repeats the error, then you have no right to win. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that really I think both negative is pretty bad all the time, okay? So I've given you the explanation for like why it can work, in reality, I do think that ideally the negative says something a little bit more specific about what exactly it is about voting negative that is productive, right? So my alternative might be something like vote negative to reject the app's security lockdown, right? And so in that case, what I'm saying is by voting negative, you're endorsing our process of criticism that is oriented towards security logic, and then I can read my solvency evidence that says scrutinizing security rhetoric is a first step toward constructing an alternative political language by which we might be able to more productively engage the world. Yeah, or, or you know, this or, you know, this is lots of big loss, big fan of big loss. Yeah. Okay, well, the first thing I want to do is convince all of you that the security critique or the critique in general is unanswerable, and then we're going to get to Jack's answer, and then you're going to think it's unwinnable. Right? They can all over the place. Well, that's ab absolutely true. Security case can't be. Yeah, Ty. So the alternative, like let's say I'm trying to like, write an alternative. Uh, the alternative is trying to say, like, what exactly? The alternative is trying to say generally something that the app has difficulty permuting. Right? And also something that enables you to read solvency evidence, saying that the intellectual endeavor you've embarked upon is a productive one. Okay, so in sort of more basic terms, what we also said is like both negative to reject the act logic of flat. Okay? It might be security, it might be capitalism, it might be Rosanthamon, you know, whatever. Um, but the key here is that it's difficult for the app to come use because what you're saying is there's this part about the affirmative that we're taking issue with. And then when you're saying 
vote negative to reject that, what you're saying is endorse our process of critical reflection that is a prerequisite to making things different. slide. Okay, so we got framework. Debating framework. Now framework I have not necessarily said, don't necessarily have the framework very good in the one and see, especially not as a separate component, but it's strongly implicit. Okay, I personally have the belief, am of the belief, that there's two types of alternative cards. There's answers to permutations and there's framework. Okay, you show me any alternative card, and I think they're actually serving one of those two purposes. Right? And if they're answering the permutation, what they're saying is the first thing we have to do, well, I guess, no, this is more the framework thing. The framework thing is saying the first thing we have to do is, you know, engage in this process of criticism. Okay, and if there's a permutation, then they say we cannot do anything but engage in this process of criticism. Okay, so the first thing about the debating framework is that you want to be clear about the question. You want to choose yeah. evidence that to the supposes what the central question for the debate should be. Alright, so the question is, what is the central question for the debate? What is the negative one? Yeah. Click that. Yeah. 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 What's our question? So like, the role of the ballot is to Okay, so yeah, I think uh, so the role of the ballot is to criticize security logic. The role of the ballot is to determine whether or not the act of security logic merits affirmation or rejection. Right? You know, one thing that I would say in the past is like the role of the ballot is to render a judgment on the one AC as a text. Okay? So what you're saying is Here's the important thing. You're saying the role of the ballot is not to answer the question of is the plan a good idea. Is the role of the ballot is the plan a good idea? Yeah, that is the question. The question is, what is the judge deciding? 
All right, and you want to answer that question so the judge knows that she or he is not deciding is the plan a good idea. Now, I guess there might be some critiques where you might be like, fine, yeah, the question is, is the plan a good idea? And you say no. But in a lot of cases, you want to say instead, the question of the debate is, you know, do the 180s belief values or assumptions merit affirmation or rejection? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, kind of. It's, it's what it is that you trying to pre-construct the nexus question for the judge, right? If you can convince the judge this is the nexus question, then you're halfway there. Absolutely. Yep. Exactly. Right? If you can, if, if think about that, if you can convince the judge this is what the question should be, that's a great position to be in. Right? You sort of write their entire 1AC to say our plan's a good idea, and you get up and you're like, these are not the words you're looking for. Right? The question is not, is the plan a good idea? The question instead is, does the 1AC's value of security merit critical scrutiny? And we assure you that in fact it does. Right? If you can see what the question is, then you put yourself in a good position to be on the right side of the answer. Okay, uh, I put up here, do you want to, yeah, yeah, clap. Um, on, or the framework itself, like, how do you set that, like, what the framework itself is like? I know it's like the base of the, how the debate on K is going to play out, but like, how would you frame it? Like how do you frame the argument? Uh, so I would frame it as the role of the ballot is like. And then the question is. Right, yeah. Matter. So something like you know, the role of the ballot is rendered judgment on the one you see as a text, right? And then I would say that, you know, I would probably read a card that says interrogating the language of security is a prerequisite to meaningful political engagement and so forth. Right, so the Bruce Hart for the SD alternative between the one and two the security week, I think is a great example of an alternative card that's actually a framework card, where it's saying the first thing that we ought to do as thinkers, educators, intellectuals, and so forth is to dwell upon the language we use to construct our advocacy, right, so that we can make that language better. Right, and if we fail to do so, then the policies we create will not work. And they will create problems. Yeah, of course. Um, normally, like sometimes the state or the framework is on a different soil and sometimes I don't bother to say, how do you like mix this or something? How do you know when it becomes that big and it's really bad? Like, like, well, if you're a negative reading and critique, you always want to be out in front on frameworks. Even if they don't make a big deal of it, you make a big deal of it. Because, if, you know, as I said, if you can get the judge convinced about what the central question is, think about it. If you can decide what the central question is, then you want to put some thought into that decision, make sure it's a question that radically benefits you, and then convince the judge that that's the question that can be decided. Right? Because then you win nine times out of ten just because the judge answered the question you want. Right? So like if I was like, Ricardo, the rule of the ballot is to vote for the guy who's wearing khakis and blue shirt glasses and sitting on a desk at front of the table. Right? Who wins the debate? I win the debate. Right? So if you can structure the question in a way that is advantageous for yourself, then that's obviously something that's helpful to you. When you start like making the role of the ballot I'm seeing like the role of the ballot is kind of like the impact map for like the K essentially if you're trying to just like vote that way. Like Not necessarily. I mean the impact map for the K is where you're doing the work of saying like, you know, security rhetoric creates the problems it tries to avoid. But no, no, no you still have a question. What was your question? Like when you start making like the role of the ballot and you it like right off the bat and like the one in here is like yeah, I generally would do it in a 2NC, um, either where you encounter a framework argument, or if you don't encounter a framework argument with your impact calculus, but I would also be reading evidence from the 1NC that sets up the framework debate. So like, I think the Bruce card, for example, is in the 1NC, is a good framework card 
put its label as an alternative argument, but I might extend it when I was explaining my framework argument in the block. Now, I do think that virtually any competent QAC is going to make some sort of framework argument. They're going to say one of two things. They're either going to say, roll the values to decide between the plan and the competitive policy outcome status quo. Or they're going to say, you know, focus on criticism instead of policy making feeds the political and that's bad. On either of those arguments, you can sort of launch into your like, here's what we think the role of the ballot should be, and here's the reason why it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so framework is sort of the question of, you know, what is the central question of the debate? Okay, um, framework is a negative argument that we'll talk about a little bit more later that is somewhat different from the way I'm using the term here. As an affirmative argument, framework is generally when the app gets up and they say, look, judge, the role of the ballot is to decide between the plan and the status quo or competitive policy option. Those are the only options you have before you. You cannot opt to vote for some nebulous process of criticism that neither defends the status quo nor some competitive policy. Right? And so they might back that up with theoretical arguments where they say it's unpredictable for the negative to be able to pick any random part of the 1AC and say it's bad, they have to focus on the plan itself, plan focus is good, etc. Or they might make a substantive argument that's less theoretical and says we need to engage in policy making or else we're just ivory tower intellectuals who complain about the world that don't do anything to make it better. Right? In either instance, your response is to clarify what you think the central question should be, and then to explain why focusing on your question is more educational and productive. If I could add something, it's kind of a tool to make to narrow down what matters in the debate. Yeah. So the way he's explaining it, the affirmer is going to get up and say, "Our one AC matters," and what you're saying on the negative is, "Sure, that stuff might matter, but." Uh, the security discourse we're engaging in, all these problems we're creating are more important, and we're reading evidence that says that this stuff's more important, so you should prefer that when you're making your decision as a judge. Absolutely. Right, if you can decide what matters and get the judge to agree with you, you put yourself in a better position. And if those things are more important, sure, the 1AC is also important, but you only care about what is happening with security discourse or what's happening with market dialogues, which might be the CAPK example, which is why it's a useful tool to get rid of the 1AC. All right, so I'm going to move on here. We'll talk. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do you want to say that people are wrong? Is debating the same? Like, how can you avoid that? Um, I mean, there's, there's a lot. Uh, you know, I, I'd say the... The biggest single thing is just being overly extended in your explanation for your argument, right? So I've tried to build this lecture so that you avoid one of those problems from the outset. But like people will mess up when they're too focused, especially early in the day, on trying to explain like a scenario for their impact, or when they're too focused on trying to stake out the alternative as something that like fiat utopia, um, you know, hear that, or they do things like they don't specify their argument in terms of the 1AC, right? You know, when I was saying like it's really important to do that specific link work, right? If people are missing that, then the critique will be a lot less effective. Um, yeah. Making it specific. Yeah, uh, defending your alternative in a way that's reasonable, right? Um, so can I put the evidence from the line to explain why they were talking about? Yeah, exactly. If you can point to specific claims in the one AC and then say those are problematic, then you specify your argument in a way that will resonate much more with most new judges. Yeah. Yeah, we'll be talking about starting to laugh a little bit. Yeah, Rachel? Um, can you explain theory versus Yeah, okay, so um, for a framework argument, some people will make like a theory argument. 
that's like, you judge cannot evaluate alternatives. You can only evaluate the plan, the status quo, or competitive policy option. And if the negatives argument does not fit into one of those uh, buckets, then you just throw it away and don't, don't think about it. Um, and so in that case, right, you're grappling with a theory argument, whereas in other instances, the opponents might say, what the negative has done is legitimate, and you are allowed to think about a judge, but you shouldn't prefer it because you should be engaged in a process of policy making, right? We need to engage in policy making, or else we're remaining always in the abstract and never concretely making the world a better place, right? But the responses to both of those arguments are pretty similar, because for both of those arguments, what you're saying is, no, we really do need to think about these issues that we've raised with our criticism, and to do so is the only educational and productive way to interact with our political world. Okay? Um, we've been rolling strong here for like an hour 20. We're going to take a little break. We'll come back when we get back to it. Cool. Excuse me. Where are you? I'm just like, hey, I'm so I'm so She has a reword. She has another reword. She has another reword. She has another reword. She has another reword. She has another
He will circle in in time to catch the next, the next few slides. So, okay. Uh, first thing I got up here to cover, this is like the last thing without really any critique on the negatives you want to know about. Uh, this is just various block tricks. Okay, and so there's a specific section of the file, it's the first section of the file that's pretty critique that has block tricks. And what block tricks really do for you is they give you a set of arguments that is incumbent upon the 1AR to respond to, or else they very quickly lose the debate. Okay, so you want to know about these arguments both as when you're submitting new critiques on the negative, these are tricky arguments that can help you quickly get ahead of the debate. And when you're affirmative, you want to know about these arguments because if you encounter them, you know in the one yard you want to deal with them. Okay, so first thing, root cause. Okay, anyone imagine what a root cause argument likely says? Arvin? Like secure addition is a root cause of you know, one of the affirmative impacts. So if you're from your against all of the positive impacts, but the, uh, the impact will be notable unless the affirmative is engaged in. Okay, yeah, I mean, that's a good example of the argument. So this is based on a distinction between a root cause and a proximate cause, okay? And a root cause is the thing that makes some consequence inevitable to occur, right? It is what happens at the base of the chain, and even though there might be a sequence of events that might lead to some consequence, the root cause is what gives it initially force. A proximate cause is the immediate spark of an action. Okay, so for example here, World War One, you all familiar with the history there? Right, okay, so how does World War One start? Right, okay, yeah. So there's this assassination, that's probably the proximate cause of World War One. Right? But a lot of people would argue that the root cause, right, was problematic diplomacy. Right, and practices of diplomacy that were carried on in secret, right behind closed doors, such that people were negotiating with multiple partners in different ways, and there was not clarity as to what the precise geopolitical circumstances were. Okay, so root cause, underlying factor that makes some consequences inevitable, proximate cause, immediate uh, spark for an action or consequence. When the critique makes a root cause argument. They say the problematic values or assumptions we have identified make the negative consequences the affirmative has identified inevitable, and therefore voting affirmative will not be able to resolve them. If you can establish that security politics make conflict with China inevitable, then even if the affirmative plan would enable us to avoid a specific scenario for conflict with China, they would not enable us to avoid conflict with China in general. Okay, yeah, do you have a question, Rachel? Yeah, okay, so the root cause and subsequent cause arguments can be very similar, except the difference is that a root cause argument does not require a self fulfilling prophecy. So if I were to say, for example, capitalism is the root cause of environmental destruction, that would not be a self fulfilling prophecy argument. I wouldn't say the environment gets destroyed because we say it's going to get destroyed. I would just say the environment gets destroyed because the economic practices engendered by the global capitalist system are inherently destructive of the natural world. Yeah, hi. Uh, sorry, can you just like, can you just re-explain this kind of like, the root cause? Yeah. yeah, so the root cause is just sort of the underlying dynamic that makes consequences inevitable, right? So, um, did, did you catch the World War One example at all? So the World War One example, right, World War One was arguably provoked by the by an assassination. Yeah. Okay? Right? So we say the assassination is the proximate cause of what caused the dominoes to fall and that we had a war. But some people would argue that that assassination would not have led to war if not for flawed diplomatic practices, right? Whereby people were unsure sure of who's their allies, who's their enemies. So it's basically just an argument of what really happened. Or like or well, what it's saying really, right, is that the affirmative deals with a lot of symptoms, right? Another way to think about this could be like symptoms versus underlying disease, right? Mm -hmm. The affirmative might deal with some of the symptoms, right, but they don't necessarily deal with the disease that is causing those symptoms in the first place, right? That's what the K, the negative, would want to argue with the critique, is to say that, you know, 
The real problem is that we orient our politics around this question of security. And so even if we're able to take marginal actions to make ourselves more secure, right, that will not prevent the problem that the security dynamics in the end of the Yeah, kind of. Um, yeah, yeah. But the beginning of the chain is the root cause. Yeah. Can you explain the definition of Oh, yeah. Well, we'll get into that. I just wanted to get through root cause. Um, so, root cause is a block trick that I get to use to sort of say after the tax rate has a goal if we don't deal with the underlying issue. Okay, self avoiding proxy, then we talked about this already a little bit. It's just the idea that you create the problems you're trying to solve. Um, Epistemology, okay? So, what is epistemology? Yeah, of course. Yeah? Yeah, Arjun, you got something there? Yeah, like how you have like, how the Fermi's knows their impact scenario in the tree. Yeah, okay, so epistemology, both those answer, right? Epistemology is generally like the study of how we know. Right? How do we know what we know? Okay, and epistemology arguments are useful with the critique because our critique can basically say the basis that you're using to make the claims you make in the 1AC is flawed, and we should think about things differently. We cannot be sure we know what the app is telling us we know, and if we study these things differently, we might come to different conclusions. Okay, so there's an argument in the security critique that I think is tagged with something like all athletes lies or something like that. Right? What it basically says is that you know we have a military industrial complex that uh, emphasizes the threats that we face in the world and plays them up in order to justify these policies that are in its own self-interest. And so we ought not to give those impacts much credibility. Right? So this is useful, for example, because you could say, you know, the idea that China is a threat is based on this structure of knowledge that is self-interested in flaw. Okay, yeah, Rachel. So what it's saying is that the research that the app has done is flawed, so when it created their plan based off of that research, that creates the flaw. Yeah, and it's also saying you should distrust their claims about harms and policy, right? Their arguments that they that these harms exist or that we'll be able to solve those problems are premised on a flawed way of knowing that does not adequately account for the complexity, right, of the world. Right, so another way you see this argument very commonly is, has anyone read the uh, Manans card? Dark throwing monkey? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay, so there's this argument that predictions fail Right, and that a study of so-called expert predictions uh, in like politics and economics came to the conclusion that if you aggregate all of these predictions, they're really no more accurate on the whole than monkeys randomly throwing darts at a dartboard to come up with a prediction of what will happen. Okay, so this is sort of an epistemology argument where you're saying geopolitical predictions, even by so-called qualified experts, are not very accurate. Uh, when we look at them in, you know, in retrospect. And so, if you can establish that the app claims are false, obviously you're putting yourself in the head because you're urging the judge to be suspicious about the solvency of harm's claims, right? I could use my epistemology arguments to say we shouldn't actually think that China is threatening, right? Or we shouldn't actually think that um, conflict is inevitable if there's, you know, less U.S. influence in Latin America, and so on and so forth. Epistemology arguments enable you to leap in there. Okay. 
Serial policy failure, another block trick argument. Serial policy failure is the argument that when we adopt these problematic beliefs, assumptions, or values, that we continually fail to solve the problems that we are attempting to address. Right? Serial policy failure is a really helpful argument. It's different from some of the above because it's more targeted at solvency rather than harms or impacts. Right? Like both root cause and self supporting proxy are ways to name to say we access these big impacts because these big impacts will happen if you don't affirm our criticism. Serial policy failure is where you say even if you vote app, you will not solve the problems they're attempting to address. So it's called the Yeah, basically. And it's saying that when we create policies through this justification of security, then we end up encountering the same problems again and again, and we're never able actually to finally resolve them. Right? So I find this argument to be really helpful when coupled with root cause and subsequent cost arguments because it enables you to say the only way to really meaningfully address the problems raised by the 1AC is to uh, adopt some alternative approach other than security informed policy making. Okay, um, ethics arguments, right? So ethics arguments are really common with the capitalism critique, but they also exist for uh, the security critique. So there's a few different ways to think about ethics, ethics arguments. The first would just be simple arguments like you have an ethical obligation to engage in this practice of criticism, right? So ethically, Capitalism is a bad system, right? Even if it produces the most wealth, right, and the greatest goods for the greatest number, the fact that it marginalizes such a significant uh, portion of the world to such a great degree means that it is unethical and worthy of rejection, right? That's something you could probably answer with a simple sort of utilitarianism argument, but it's still potentially useful for the negative because if you don't answer ethical obligation, you're pretty bad shape. Um, Another form of the ethics argument would be value to life arguments, right? To say that when we are in a framework of security or capitalism, that life is assigned no value, but instead just some sort of numeric entity, and that there can be you know, dehumanization of that life, or that life is not able to experience the quality of life, right? And the reason why value to life impacts are popular among paid haters is because they try to use them to basically say, like, even if the app wins an extinction impact, we've won that extinction doesn't matter because there's no value to life. Obviously, some of them from serve claims, um, affirmative are able to respond to this, I think, pretty well, typically by saying, like, you know, you should let people determine their own value to life and survival is a prerequisite to having value in one's life. But it's still a potentially useful argument for the negative to make if they don't have, um, you know, if the app doesn't make sense. So just briefly one more time, bad life arguments say that, for example, you know, security treats every human life as a number instead of as a human being, and we start to place their survival above their quality of life as the primary concern, which means that people do not have a good quality of life, and that's bad. Okay? Any questions at this point with the black trick? Cool. So we're not going to talk about the polling text right now because we're going to keep it in. <laughs> All righty. So answering the critique. We had Karl Marx, right, to introduce us. Keep getting the critique on the negative. And then who this guy is? Karl Marx's brother. <laughs> <laughs> this is Dick Cheney. OK, Dick Cheney. That's, that's the we're about to answer your K face. All right. So answering the critique. First thing. Start with the 1AC. Okay, if you want to be in a good position to answer the critique, the first thing you have to do is write a 1AC that is equipped to deal with the critique. Okay? So the first thing, right? Have some sort of critical defense of your affirmative. Okay, so this can be a number of things, right? You could have an argument in the 1AC about why your 1AC is ethical, right? You could have arguments in the 1AC about how the app is a good idea to avoid human suffering, or you know you might just choose to go with claims like we should try to protect the environment, for example. 
It's important to note that no argument is going to totally dodge the negative's ability to read a critique. There's always some critique the negative can come up with, that you, even on a critical act, right? But if you have some critical defense of your 1AC, you at least know that you can defend it, right, and cut answers to the critiques you're likely to encounter, and then use it to answer the critiques that aren't especially well equipped against it, right? So if you think you're going to make a security critique, right, having 1AC impacts that are about human suffering and you know, ethics and so forth is really valuable because the big primary argument about security critique is that we shouldn't conceive of life as sort of an end goal in and of itself, right? We shouldn't conceive of security as a ceiling. If anything, it should be a floor. Well, if you have a 1AC advantage about you know, mass suffering, then you can say, look, we're not just concerned with survival. We are concerned with people's quality of life. We are saying that security should be a floor and not a ceiling. Right? And you're in much better shape to defend that theorization of security, human security, than you are when you're trying to defend national security. Right? Yeah, yeah. Can you explain the Yeah, okay, so a big argument about security critique, uh, when the negative is making a security critique argument, they're basically saying that the problem with security politics is that when it gets on a roll, security becomes a ceiling right, and not a floor. So security becomes the only thing we care about instead of the first thing we care about, okay? A good act response is generally to say, we conceive of security as a floor and not a ceiling, right? So security is not all that matters. It is just something that does matter and is important for other considerations to happen, right? One of the better act answers I've seen against security critique is this guy who argues basically that it's a privilege of the secure to criticize security politics and that those people who you know have to worry about how they're going to eat on a day-to-day -day basis are not really in a position to criticize security politics because they are insecure right so yeah kind of right so it's the idea um that, well, I guess you know, there's some differences, um, but yeah. So, like, the security is not an important thing. Exactly. Right, exactly. And so, the idea here for the app would be to say we need to provide that sort of modicum of security no matter what. And it might be true that we should only and exclusively be concerned with security, but we should still try and prevent human suffering and use security as a way to enrich people's quality of life. Okay? Um, so having a defense of your authority that can that can talk with the case and deal with them. Okay, next eliminate suspects and hyperbolic claims. Okay, so it's amazing how people will be drawn to rhetorically powerful evidence even when those cards lack warrant, right, and are probably not the greatest arguments. There's a lot of impact cards, for example, that are just like over the top, and the security pay debater is just like their dream. You know, so like in this China VA, right, there's the card that's like, the CCP wouldn't hesitate to kill a billion people with biological weapons because they're mean, you know? Like the, you know, I, the, I don't know what card I'm talking about for. I think you read that card yesterday in that debate. And it's like, if you're writing your 1AC and you think you're going to make security critique, that's a card I might not include, right? Because that card is it is not very well substantiated, right? It's not from a particularly qualified source, but it does get you in some trouble insofar as it's making some potentially racist accusations that are not well substantiated. Okay, so, you know, I guess it helps you to read it in your TMC when you know you're not reading a K app, fine. But in your 1AC, I think you want to pick, you know, strong claims that you can defend from a methodological perspective, right, that are not uh, subject to hyperbole and overstatement. You can write a good 1AC with good cards, I promise. 
it's worth doing. Okay, um, bolster your credibility, right? So we talked about epistemology argument as something the negative wants to go to. The affirmative also wants to go to epistemology argument sometimes to say, our epistemology is <coughs> good, and your k-authors are a bunch of hippies who are talking about things they don't know anything about, right? Um, so this is something I've seen done very effectively with affirmative about like asteroids or global warming and that kind of thing, where you just kind of say like, the science tells us that there is a legitimate possibility of very bad things happening. Um, qualified people say so, and a lot of research says so. Right? That is a much stronger rationale for action than, you know, a newspaper article that says some country is just going to go nuts and want to the heat. Okay, and if all else fails, prepare to roll hard. What I mean by this is, if you're going to write an app where you just want to indulge in the hyperbole and the nonsense, then, you know, understand you're probably not going to be able to roll with K-style defenses, and it's important just to get strong on criticism approaches fail. And we'll talk about how to do that in a little bit. Okay? So moving on to the two AP. Yeah, yeah. So like when the um, one AP has a good argument that like really rhetorical and stuff, do you do you say like those like have racist implications? Do you just say it like that's all you shouldn't like give that so it depends. I mean, I think the ideal way to do it would be to find cards that substantiate that those sorts of claims are problematic. Okay, so for example, there's a guy named Pan who's written some articles saying that we problematically construct China as a threat in the United States, and that when we do so, that provides the impetus for conflict between the two nations, right, and that we ought to abandon that securitizing frame in our interactions with China. So if I was debating this on the negative, I would probably say they read this card that makes these problematic assumptions about China, and that's bad, cause of self only prophecy, only criticism is false. And then I would read the pan card. Right? And so that's what I'm talking about in terms of modules. Remember earlier I was saying read modules on the negative? If you can connect, here's a card from one AP. Here's a claim they make that's problematic, and then evidence that says it is problematic and causes self fulfilling prophecy. You've connected specific link work with impact and evidence. That would be a module. Does that make sense to everyone? Right? Like, and I might, I said, like, create crafty title, title. You know, I don't really know what the crafty title would be, but like, China Threat, you know, would be something where you could be like, in the 2 NR, you could be like, if the one error doesn't answer, right? They have not addressed our China threat model. Even if we're behind on most of the security pay, they have not answered specifically the argument that the 1AC problematically constructs China as a threat in a way that creates a self fulfilling prophecy, only criticism solved, means the app impacts are inevitable unless you vote neg. Even if we're wrong in general about security, our specific China module means that we are ahead in this game. Right? It's like a mini DNA. <laughs> Okay, so any more questions at this point before you move on to 2AC? Okay, so 2AC. You're writing your 2AC against a critique. Uh, first thing is permutation. Okay, against almost any critique, you probably want to make a permutation. Really, against any critique or any counterclaim, the 2AC, you can always make a permutation. You may not go for the permutation, but it should just be automatic for the 2A that when you hear critique or when you hear counterclaim, in the 2AC, you say permutation. Because what's the worst thing that happens? They spend more time on it than you do. You don't go for it. Right? Um, I, I briefly mentioned this before to my lab, but I'll just say to everyone, right, I think that you should almost never lose on any permutation of the voting issue. Because the permutation is a test of competition. And so if someone says, your firm is bad, it's a voting issue, your response should be, if the perm is bad, then you reject the permutation, not the team. It's just the test of competition. If the 1AR says that, almost no judge will vote against you on the permutation of the voting issue. 
Okay, um, so permutation. The other reason you want to make a permutation is because in a lot of circumstances it can be really helpful. Like apart from the fact that it's just a good argument to have against all counterclaims and critiques, it also is something that enables you to say, combine the best elements of their criticism with the best elements of our affirmative, and let's see how it works out. All right, any questions back there? What type of permutation should you say? Like, should you say perm do the alt or something like that? So, that's a good question. Um, in my opinion, I think that the permutation you should read in the 2AC for the most part is perm do the app and, and then portions of the text of the critique. Right? So, you don't just say do both because a lot of times the alternative includes stupid things like both negative or reject the app. So you can't combine the two plans. Right? You also generally remember you want to include all of the plan and all the part of the alternative. So do the alt is kind of the tough sell. Do the alt is a permutation that people make because of an argument that negatives make, which is that the alternative can include the app, which is really bad. But um, so the, the app will respond to that by saying do the alt and include the app then. So you get to permute that way. But for the most part, you want to construct a permutation that says perm do the app and insert part of their alternative text that you can combine. Okay. What, but what if their text is like do nothing or vote neg? Like, yeah, I, you know, I, I think that um, it I, depends on if they have a tag below that. Right? I, I honestly think that if their text does say that, you should be able to go into their evidence and find what it's really saying that you need to do because it never actually says do nothing or vote negative. Yeah. Um, and then like the argument for where it's like it's illegal, you can't do that is, well, you're reading an entire criticism about each part of the 1AC and how all of those assumptions are bad. We get to read into your evidence too and point out parts of it. Yeah, I think that's one way of going about it. I think that if ideally if they have a tag below, like vote neg or reject the app or whatever, that's a better place to mine just because it's actually something they've attached to their tag. Um, I also think that, um, I think you're right theoretically, but I think the negative response there or the app compromise that makes the most sense to me would just be, Neg doesn't get to explain their alternative beyond the mere act of voting negative if they're not going to defend anything else the app can permute. Okay. Um, I'm someone who likes to go for a perm in the 2 AR like every round, so. Yeah, that's fair. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there, there's a variety of different approaches you can take to permute the critique. The, the main thing is just make sure that you include a permutation so that you can combine the elements of their criticism with the parts of the app you can recover. Yeah. Um, and I could add one more thing. Um, well, the permutation could, like, that could go on for a while, an entirely separate lecture on it. Mm -hmm. It's also important to have it around uh, just because a lot of K teams, as you stated before at the beginning of this lecture, they like to say, oh, our alt solves everything. Yeah. And just like a counter plan that just, like, solves world hunger and has nothing to do with the app. Perm do both probably defeats that. So that's the same thing. A permutation also solves everything, and there's a reason to prefer because you have a 1AC. So it's always something good to have around and something good to say in around. Does everyone know what a permutation is? Sure. Okay. Because if you come and do that, you want. I'm going to review it anyway. All right. If the, if the app reads their plan and then the negative is like, counter plan, let's do something else that's super awesome, right? The permutation is the way that the affirmative says, unless you demonstrated that what you proposed cannot be done to sit at the same time as the affirmative, it's not a reason to vote negative. Okay, so if the plan is, right, economic engagement with Cuba, and the counter plan is aid to Africa, then the app gets to say permutation, there's no reason that aid to Africa means you shouldn't also have economic engagement with Cuba. Right, the only way the negative can do permutation is with a disadvantage to the plan, a net benefit, or an argument about mutual exclusivity. And so similarly with the critique, if the negative is like the role of the alternative is that security politics no longer exists, right? 
then the app should be able to permute and say, both app and security politics no longer exist. Right? And that solves all of the impacts to the negative. And if you can recover any advantage, then you have a reason to prefer to You should actually probably want to prefer it again. Ask to the presumption of rule of the Competing option by the negative. Okay? Cool. What will the valid argument? Yeah, yeah, question. Uh, well, the best way to respond generally is to say, here's our specific link to the 1AP, right? The reasons why their app in, in particular is incompatible with our criticism. And then to read evidence saying that when we try to combine the project of criticism with policy making, then that criticism gets subordinated and crowded out by security considerations or whatever, whatever however else you want to look at. So there's good evidence. Um, in, in our security K file that says that criticism gets systematically crowded out when we engage in these liberal policy making approaches that just incorporate criticism. Okay? Next up, rules about. All right. Next argument is roll the ballot. Okay, so we know the negative wants to make roll the ballot arguments, so we on the affirmative want to counter their ability to do so by proactively making roll the ballot arguments. And what this means is that you might say things both like the roll of the ballot is compared to plan versus the status quo or competitive policy option, and we might also read evidence about the importance of, of approaches oriented toward policy making vis-a-vis -vis those oriented toward criticism. Okay, you want to hit the hammer on the idea that the judge should be, should be answering the question of is the plan a good idea, and if not that, the judge should be at the very least skeptical of approaches which put all of their eggs in the basket of criticism. Okay, uh, the next thing is offense against the alternative, right? So this is where arguments like seeds of political have a role to play. Can anyone explain the seeds of political arguments? Like, Okay, so the idea with see the political right is that Congress and the government of Washington, D.C. exist. And those of us who are critical minded, right, and concerned about security politics have two choices. We can either abandon that government in Washington, D.C. and spend our time in libraries talking with other like-minded intellectuals, or we can get out there on the ground and try and change the policies that are operative right now. Okay, and the idea is that if we don't go fight in the halls of Congress and fight about policy making, then those arenas get taken over by even less critical minds. Right? So the idea is that the most critical minds can't just occupy themselves with criticism. They need to refuse to abandon the halls of power, lest those halls of power be colonized by the worst possible forces that would do the most damage. Yes? Yeah. Well, what they're saying is that we should, even if we're concerned about security politics, you might want to provisionally use it to appeal to a broader audience in trying to make the world a better place. Right? So the idea is if the negative is saying don't do policy making, just do critical process of questioning, then the app wants to say that approach means that we never get to the important business of policy making. And policy making is really important, or else the policies will get worse and worse 
because those of us who are best informed to make policy better will remain outside of the place where policy making happens. Okay, so seeds of political, I think, is good offense against the alternative. Um, you know, there's different forms of offense against the alternative depending on which critique you're dealing with. Right, like against the capitalism critique, a lot of people will say those who criticize capitalism often devolve into violence. Right, and that is bad, etc. But having those sorts of arguments is a good way to sort of put yourself in a position to say that, you know, we should not just jump head first into criticism rather than engage in the detail of the, the policy proposed by the act. Okay, so next, epistemology and methodology arguments. Make sure you're able to defend your reasoning and how you come to your conclusions. Specific answers to the critique, obviously, right? Depending on which critique they read, you might make different arguments. But then don't forget about the 1AC, right? All too often, when affirmative schemes are engaged in a critique, they'll get bogged down making specific answers and reading their cards and not dealing with the fundamental reason to vote affirmative. You read a 1AC, you know, the key element of being a critique is winning that the 1AC is presenting a good idea, and so you don't want to get bogged down in debate about, you know, what Frederick Nietzsche said. You want to instead continually force the debate to happen on your terms and force the negative to deal with your arguments for why your affirmative is a good thing. Okay? 1AR. The 1AR the ball has been advanced, right? So I posted up here and have a checklist, right? So the main thing is that you gotta be ready to simultaneously explain why your 1AC is a good idea, carry forward your specific answers to the critique, and deal with the block tricks. Right? I said those block tricks were all pretty deadly for the negative. So in a 1AR is where you deal with those tricks, but you're also carrying forward your reasons to vote affirmative and carry forward your specific answers. So again, don't forget about the 180, right? You want to continually be reminding the judge that the reason to vote affirmative is because the 1AC has presented some good arguments and not getting you know, sucked into a debate about the merits of their particular criticism. Right? You want to make the arguments probably proactively that the critique doesn't turn case or take out policy, since that's the argument you know that they're going to be trying to make, and it's bad for you. Yeah, Ty, do you have a question? Oh, I okay. um, you want to carry forward your arguments about the alternative and especially make the argument that the alt doesn't solve the act. Yeah. All right, these two, two and three up here, are just particularly important. I recommend on virtually any critique you face in the 1AR, at some point you want to say the critique doesn't turn the case and the alt doesn't solve the case. Okay, those two arguments probably win more K debates for the negative than should be allowed. Yeah, you want to, I mean, like the negative will try to, this, you know, Ricardo was talking about how the negative a lot of the times will say your alternative does all sorts of different things and like that's why you want to have a permutation in play. Sometimes the negative will even go so far as to say, you know, embracing their process of criticism solves the affirmative impact. And so you want to make simple arguments like, you know, can't solve our impact without doing our plan, etc., just so that the negative can't get up in the two and be like, they have conceived that the alternative solves the app. Given that the alternative solves the app, we don't need to win much of our critique at all because there is no reason to go to that. Right? So you want to make sure you have those two arguments in the checklist so they can't easily get away with you no longer have your case. Kate, do you have a question? Okay. Cool. So those two arguments support the checklist. Again, roll of the ballot is another essential argument. Like this is really a, a crucial checklist. The, the more I look at it, the more proud I am of my PowerPoint. <laughs> because two and three are essential, but then four is essential as well. Because, you know, again, this is what I was talking about earlier. You can't let them control the question. If they're able to tell you that the question of the one AC is, is security politics a good thing, that's kind of slanted against you, right? You want to reaffirm the question they made is, is the app a good idea? You know, at the very least, you want to say, what ought to be preferred, our app or their alternative, right? That's a good middle of the road question that lets both sides access their offense 
one thing you can't do is let them establish that the affirmative doesn't even matter, and it's only a question about security politics writ large. All right, and then once again, your specific answers, they are important, and you want to have specific answers to every critique, um, but don't forget about the 180 first, and don't forget about covering the essential basis. One thing, the reason I put specific answers up here in both these slides is because there was a while, and I don't think this is still happening, but there was a while when teams would write K two AC blocks, and they would just write one two AC block for every critique, as if every critique were the same. But they're really not, right? The difference between capitalism and security and other critiques is so tremendous that if you encounter critiques you don't have answers to, you want to cut answers to them. That's not to say you might not notice similarities, right? Like someone in my lab was talking about how they made a tight term with the next team called it managerialism, which is just like a cheesy change of the name, right? So those two critiques are in fact the same, right? But Heidegger is not the same as, say, Nietzsche. And so that's why you want to have specific answers, depending on which critique you're making. OK, 2AR, tell a story. Notice the first thing that you have to do for the 2AR. So for did for 1AC. OK, the 2AR is the place where you say, our app is really sweet. Their person is not a reason to reject the app. Anything that's permutation is a preferable option. but R1 AC is definitely sweet. Okay, if you do not mention your advantages, right, and why the app is a good idea in the 2AR, you will lose. Because if this critique, if the game is just about critique on its own terms without any mention of the 1 AC, you are in big trouble. Right? And I can't tell you how many times I've seen this happen in really big debates in both high school and college. It's like the app just got totally mind trick, where all of a sudden they forgot that they read a 1AC and they just think they're going to beat the critique because they have good answers to the critique. But this would be like debating a politics TA and not saying case outweighs, right? You might have great answers to politics and you might whittle down the risk of the DA to like 0.01, but when that risk of the DA is 0.01 and you have not extended your case, you lose, okay? so. When you're affirmative in the 2AR, you must be talking about your case. You know, case is a disadvantage of the alternative most of the time. You, again, if you've gotten through the 1AR, you've argued the alternative doesn't solve the case, right? If you've been able to effectively establish that argument, then the reasons the app is a good idea are the reasons why the alternative is a bad idea. Because the alternative doesn't do the app. So that's built in offense for you to sort of build from the ground out and be getting, you know, good work in the 2AR from the work you did in the 1AC. Rule the ballot argument. Again, you really ought to force the issue so you don't lose on them being able to control the central question of the debate. All right, impact calculus, again, always a major feature in the last few rebuttals. Are, but generally, against the critique, right, the impact calculus that's most effective is that which says avoid short time frame impacts because we can deal with longer term issues later. Right? So even if security politics in general has some bad habits and trajectories associated with it, and we ought to get away from security politics, if you can win that we urgently need to do something in the terrain of economic engagement with Latin America right now, then you're basically saying live to fight security another day. Yeah, that's just like, that's the general impact framing that I think works for app against the K, is just to say like, look, our way to establish that really bad things are gonna happen really soon, we need to take action now, you know, we can deal with these problems later on down the line. Now I will say the caveat is, to some extent you gotta be careful about that because you're basically playing right into their hands with the security critique if you're saying, we're really insecure. But at the, other, at the other side, it's like if you can win that and win your epistemology and methodology is right, you know, then it's a lot more difficult for them to just be dismissive, right? It's a lot more difficult for the judge to look you in the eye and be like, I disregarded all of your harms if you spent some of your 2AR being like, they're real, all doesn't solve them, they don't have good indictments of them except for this crappy card that says the military industrial complex makes up everything which is obviously false. We're reading evidence from qualified experts. 
You get that for QAR. The judge isn't going to be like, yeah, I just disregarded your advantage because you know it seems like it securitizes. That's that's a less likely decision if you do that work. Okay, and then again, specific answers definitely definitely really important, but they come after your carrying forward as the one AP and your impact count and so forth. Okay, is there a question? Yeah, so if you were the alternative to solve your app, right, doesn't engage in the actions that you're saying are needed to solve your advantage, then all of the problems that you've isolated are reasons the alternative is bad. Right? So if you win that we're going to have environmental collapse in the next, you know, year because of oil drilling, then you can be like, yes. Maybe we need to engage in a process of criticism, but if we engage the process of criticism at the expense of taking concrete measures to address this imminent environmental collapse, then we're not going to be able to enjoy the fruits of a world where security politics resonate less thoroughly. Right? So the impacts to the app are reasons that we should prefer our plan to the negative alternative. Is what you're arguing. Okay, uh, next, the K Act. Do you know who this guy is? Um, no. No? Um, no Chomsky. Right? No Chomsky, the master of the K Act. He, uh, he's, he's critical of the way things are, but he's also optimistic that, you know, perhaps if things were different at an institutional level, then things could be better. Okay, so, different types of K Act you want to be familiar with, both as opportunities for you to run and of things your opponents might take. Right? So critical defense is a topical action, right? This is where you might just say something like the embargo against Cuba is, you know, violent and exploitative and causes suffering, therefore we ought to lift the embargo. Right? It would be it'd be a totally topical action, but it wouldn't be oriented around big huge war impacts. It would be oriented more around philosophical and ethical Based, uh, based useful actions. Okay, critiques that affirm the topic non traditionally, right? So, what I mean by this is that uh, you might not, for example, read a plan, right? Like, what if I got up in the 1AC and my entire 1AC was just a critique of the embargo against people, right? I think some people would argue you gotta have a plan, but some people would argue if, if, if you're critiquing the embargo, then you're implicitly arguing on behalf of economic engagement. Right? So in high school, I do think you could be able to win probably against that sort of app on framework, right? That in order to be topical, you heard as much for that prevent a concrete kind of action. But it's worth noting that that sort of affirmative is something out there you may have to deal with. All right, an outright critique of the topic. Is sometimes a critical affirmative. I tend to find this to be the least uh, persuasive strategy for a critical affirmative because switch side maybe is probably good. Um, should maybe have to find ways to affirm the topic, even if they're not, you know, traditional policy. But it's worth noting that some people just feel like the topic is bad, and that's their affirmative. Um, and then critique of traditional debating practices, right? This is becoming more and more popular um, at the national debate tournament in college this year. The team that won was didn't read the plan, right? Uh, didn't talk about the topic really. They just said that you know they shouldn't be excluded from debates. Debates the home, um, and the traditional debating practices are exclusionary, and you should reject them in favor of their act. So. You know, that is something that you're probably going to encounter more and more going forward. So it's worth thinking about as a critical app uh, that you're likely to see. Okay, so negative responses. What are your options available to you? Obviously, in some part, this depends on which type of critical affirmative the app has chosen, right? But general toolbox of things that you can use, right? So framework. Framework is the argument that the app has to prevent a topical plan, right, to defend a concrete 
example of resolutional action that they will defend and be helpful to you. Okay, and you'll see more or less stringent framework arguments depending on what the firm has done. Right, like if you try to read no plan, sometimes negative will just be like they have to have an earlier statement of advocacy. If you try to read the plan that's not possible, sometimes they'll be like they have to be a possible plan. Right? And so it's the, the goalposts kind of shift. But the idea here is just for you say that the critical affirmative has not met the threshold for topical action required of the app, and therefore they ought to leave. Similar to a topicality argument, uh, but it's different because you might agree that the affirmative is defending topical action, right? So like remember the example I said where you read no plan, but you say the embargo is bad and you critique the embargo, right? Like you might think they're defending topical action, but they haven't done so in the framework we expect in policy debate where they present an instrumental policy option on which the debate hinges. Okay, uh, so we could talk, you know, for this full two and a half hours about the data framework. For now, just take note of the fact that it is an important element of the negative strategy against critical affirmative because it sets a set of thresholds about what the affirmative has to do in order to have a legitimate act. All right, the counterclaim plus disad strategy, I find to be generally productive against the critique. Uh, right, if you can, if they're if their app is just a critical defense of topical action, right, then if you can defend doing something to solve the impact they've outlined with a net benefit, put yourself in pretty good shape to win, right? The ideal example of this that I enjoyed a lot in college and I was making is a word pick. Right, does anyone know what a word pick is? No. Um, a word. You don't know what they don't know. Yeah, what do you got? Okay, well that's what you're identifying with the word pick, right? And then it's wrong. Yeah, exactly, right? So you identify an objectual word and then you replace it with something else and you need a counter plan where you replace it, right? So. My favorite example of this of all time is there's this word pick out of the word fork. And it's some of the most fantastic cards I've ever seen in my entire life. Right? Like foreign. And this guy wrote these cards where he's like, Congress, when they're writing legislation, should refuse to name their bills with the word foreign because it is inhospitable language. To call someone foreign or another country foreign is negative, exclusionary, and instead we should use the word international assistance. And it just so happened that I stumbled upon this on a topic where the resolution included the term foreign assistance. And so, I, you know, I can't tell you how many debates this one against KF, because you know, you made a KF, and they're like, oh, we're going to use these other countries, so we should give them some foreign assistance. And I'm like, counterclaim, we should give them international assistance. And your use of the term foreign is quite violent, thank you. <laughs> right? and, and so like that's the sort of thing where it's like against the chaos, if you can like pick one word that they've used and say that word is not something we should use to frame our actions. Instead, here's a better one. Right? That's a pretty good strategy for counter plan that benefit where you can sort of say like we agree with pretty much everything they said. We have a counter plan that does everything they do, except we've used a different word because Okay, uh, case turn, right? So some people just feel like they want to take the gloves off and just throw it down, right? So if the app walks in and they're like, critical app, hegemony is bad, right? We're violent, we need the world. I'm sure Mr. Will Kaplan, who some of you might be familiar with, would just be like, hey, bad, boom, and just throw down on head good. Because he loves hegemony. That's his thing. Right, so if they read an impact that you can roll against, right, if their app was just a criticism of the economy, and they were saying, like, you got to stop economic growth, it's the same thing. What's happening is just, like, slow down and growth good. And so if you want to do that, it's always an option that's available to you. And then finally, right, the strategy we call out left them, where if they've 
chosen to do some sort of marginally critical action, then you might choose to engage in an even more robust criticism that is more radical or whatever you want to say to left and right. They're hungry. Okay. No, it's all, it's all good. Um, you know, we, we did kind of reach a stopping point. Um, the next thing I was going to do was just kind of go through the different critiques you want to turn on the topic. There should be a separate camp. Ask your lab leaders to teach you. I know a lot about the critique. Also knows something about the critique, right? Also knows something about the critique, right? What? Oh, wait, 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 one second. <laughs> All right, you can do it now.